Hey, welcome back. So I always get super excited at the thought of learning a brand new programming language. And today we're going to learn NIM, which has been getting a lot of buzz in the area of malware development. So the big question is, what is exciting the malware developers about this programming language and what can we learn from them and is it applicable in a less sketchy environment? So what's interesting about NIM? The first thing is it's a systems programming language. So if you want to build an executable that's very small, that's not depending on things like a virtual machine, doesn't have things like garbage collection, so it's really about low-level systems programming, which is compiled language rather than a dynamic language and is statically typed, then that is the class that NIM lives within. So if you think of languages today such as C or Rust or Zig, then it's the same sort of class of languages. Now what is different about NIM in this case is it's not overly influenced by the C language. Its actual base comes from Pascal based languages. So if you think of things like Pascal itself or Ada or Modula, then it's that same sort of class. So it's a very, very simplistic language. And in fact, if you're something like a TypeScript developer, which again is heavily influenced by Pascal, in fact I have a video on that, then that's going to feel quite familiar to you. So it's a very, very simple language. And in fact, if you think about why malware developers are probably super interested in something like NIM, is here is a super simple language which doesn't have a lot of boilerplate where you can generate really low level code um, and you can run it as an executable without any dependencies and it runs multi-platform, then of course that's a very interesting thing for them because you can just focus on getting the job done as opposed to being exposed to the complexities of a low-level systems language. And again, if you've ever dealt with something like C or Rust or Zig, then it takes a bit of time for a lot of those concepts to sink in. Whereas if you come from a world where you're more used to JavaScript or you're more used to Python, then at that point, NIM is going to feel like a really great easy language to get started with and you can focus on just getting the job done. And I think that's why malware developers are flocking to NIM at the moment. So okay, if you want to get started with NIM, you can go to nimlang.org and again, it's got some nice examples online for you. And again, if you want to download it, you can click on the download page and then you can see there's a Windows installation, a Unix installation, or in our case, I'm going to install it on Mac. In Mac, if you want to install it, you're going to have to have Clang already installed uh, and you can do that just by installing uh, Xcode and then if you want to install uh, NIM, you can just do brew install NIM and then that's going to install that for you. I've already got that installed on my machine, so we're not going to do that. Once you've installed NIM, you can do NIM dash dash version and then you can check that NIM is in fact installed. So you can see I'm currently running version 1.614 on my machine. So as always, we're going to start with a hello world just to get comfortable with the language and then we're going to get into the more complicated features. So to do that, we are going to just create a file called uh, hello.nim. I'm just doing that with touch, touch hello.nim. That will create the file and then if I want to open that in VS Code, I can type in VS Code and then you can see my hello.nim is there. If you're living in a VS Code world, you probably want to install a NIM extension. So if you just uh, go into extensions, type in NIM, you can see there's some fairly decent extensions there already. There's one by Konstantin Zaitsev, so I'll just hit install there. And then you can have uh, you know, a VS Code extension to help you with all the highlighting, etc. Okay, so to get started, we'll just write a comment that says hello world there. So again, you can see the Python influence there with hashes to comments. Again, moving away from these uh, C style influences in the language. So it's pretty cool. If you're used to scripting languages, this is going to feel very natural. And then if I want to do some variable assignments, then it's kind of like JavaScript here. I can just type in var hello equals uh, hello and then I can move on here and then if I want to say world var world equals uh, world. Notice I don't need to put semicolons to do statement separation and then I can do echo hello and we'll put a space here and we'll say world. So in the language of NIM you can see in this particular case, comma is acting as your concatenation. So in a C style language, you might be used to plus. Uh, in the case of NIM, 
then its comma is going to act as that concatenation for strings. So if I save that and then I come back to my terminal and then I can type in nim c, so c for compile, and then I'm going to put minus r because r means go run it. So I want to compile it and then I want to run it and I will type in hello.nim. And then you can see there, it's done all its compilation. That's all very interesting. And then it's gonna come back with hello world. So I now have a working application. And if I wanna change that, if I wanna say uh, hello, Chris, we can just run that again. And then you can see it's came back with hello, Chris. Now there's a couple of things that are interesting about NIM before we get into more of the details here. The compilation method is super interesting. It's less about compilation and it's more about transpilation. So it's kind of similar to TypeScript in that sense. So in a language like TypeScript, what happens is it transpiles down into JavaScript and then you're good to go from there. In NIM, it transpiles down to different languages. So you can sort of compile it down to C or you could even compile it down to JavaScript. So rather than compiling directly down into uh, low level assembly, et cetera, then there's an in-between step where you're compiling down into a language. So it's more of a kind of transpilation than a compilation. So let's go into a little bit more detail here for a second. So. You know, as I said before, the var keyword is used for variable assignment. It's for mutable variable assignment. So if I wanted to, I could then take the world and then I could set that equal to uh, Fred. And then if I save this and run this again, you're gonna see now it's gonna say hello, Fred. And that's because I've done my uh, initial declaration of the variable world and set its initial value to Chris, but then I've changed it down here and I've set the uh, value of world to Fred. So when I do the echo hello world, then it's coming back with uh, Fred rather than Chris. But of course, if I ran that twice here and run this again, I can get hello Chris and hello Fred. So it's a mutable variable assignment. So once I've set the uh, value of the variable, I can then change it whenever I want. So the next thing to point out is NIM supports type inference. So even though it's a statically compiled language, so not a dynamic language such as Python or JavaScript, it can infer the underlying type. So in this case, for both hello and world, I've set the uh, initial value to a string. So therefore, because I've set that initial value, then it's inferred that the type of this is a string. So if I wanted to be more explicit, then I could use a type annotation. So I could just say something like var, uh, let's say Chris, and we could set that equal to a string and we'll say uh, Chris, let's put that back to a world and now I could go hello world and then I could put Chris here as well and we could run this one more time and you can see now it says hello world and Chris and that is because I've set the type as a string. Now if I change this to something like an int, uh, you're gonna see here, it got a string for Chris, but expected an int because I've set a different type uh, than I've actually done in my initial declaration. So again, type inference, super good. Um, you can obviously set the types if you wanna be more explicit, like I've done here. And again, you will have seen type annotations in languages such as Pascal or Ada, which again, another Pascal-based language, or of course, anyone who's coming from a JavaScript uh, background, or even for things like Rust, then type annotations form part of that. So you will be used to that already. Now, the next thing about NIM stylistically, it follows what we call the offside rule. Offside rule in this case was influenced by Python, but actually goes much further back in time. It comes originally from a Peter Landon paper. And really what the offside rule means is any non-white space token to the left of first such token on the previous line is taken to be the start of a new declaration. Basically, what it's meaning is your blocks are being influenced by the white space. Let me show you what I mean. So if I change this and then I just put var hello, and then we can change this world. Let's get rid of this here. And we can make this world equals world. And that is a typical looking uh NIM declaration. So I've got var, but hello and world are at the same level. And again, if I run this here, 
and we just run nim, you can see it's come back with hello. So notice in this case, I don't need to prefix uh, world with var, you know, in this particular case, it knows that hello and world is both as part of the same declaration. Of course, if I try and do something like ending equals uh, uh, this, I'm gonna get a red squiggly. And the reason I'm gonna get a red squiggly is I'm not within this var block as such here. So therefore I need to do an explicit declaration if I wanna do that. So if I put in var here, and then I put ending, then that's gonna work here. And then you'll see uh, hello world. This also means that if I wanna put in another variable, I could say I want an ending, I'm gonna put an exclamation point at the end of my hello world. You can see I've not used that at the moment, so we will just add ending. If I save that, that's all gonna be good. I run it, you can see it's gonna be hello world. But if I take this ending and I take it outside of that block, so it's not following the offside rule, you see I'm gonna get a red squiggly, so the ending has no type. So I would need to put var before that and then I could run it again, and you see I'm back to having hello world. So again, if you come from a C-based background, then you'd be used to kind of the bracket syntax that you would typically see that defines structure in a program. If you came from a sort of Pascal background, you would be used to this sort of begin and end, whereas in this case, Nim is influenced by Python and is using indentation to represent a program structure. And again, I think that is a simpler and kind of better way forward, and I like that within the Nim language. So it's a, it's a good influence. But again, if you see this in Nim language, at least you know what's going on. It's, it's basically program structures and scope is defined in the same way as you would be used to in Python. With that being said, although uh, you don't need statement separation, if you want to, you could actually separate with a semicolon. So I could just put uh, var hello equals hello. I could separate this with a semicolon, and then I could actually take this whole echo function here, put that on the end, and then I could end this with a semicolon. So although I don't need a statement separate with the semicolon, I can just use uh, new lines. If I want to, I can use a semicolon to statement separate, which of course is very useful for things like functional programming. So again, if I just take my uh, uh, hello world, I'll statement separate this, I'll put the var back, so I've got var equals hello, world equals world, we'll sta statement separate this, um, we'll get rid of ending there for simplicity's sake. We'll get rid of ending here. I'm gonna semicolon terminate this, and I'm gonna bring this up to a single line here. And now if I save that, and then we just uh, run our program again, you see hello world works. So it does support semicolon statement separation, but it also supports new line as well. So it's up to you on what you wanna use. If you're being more functional, or you're trying to do things within a single line, then I suspect you're gonna to lean towards uh, semicolons. But in general, uh, you're pretty much gonna to stick to the kind of more Python-esque offside rule type style. Now to go a little bit deeper, as with other languages, once I've declared a variable, I cannot redeclare that variable uh, with in my application. So if I type in something like, um, you know, let's say uh, fish here, and do a hello world. So my world, I've redeclared. We're within the same scope because I'm in a kind of global block at the moment, everything is global variables. So if I try and redeclare that world within the same scope, I'm gonna get an error, right? Because I've previously declared that. So you can't uh, redeclare variables once they're declared within the same scope. Um, you know, the second thing that I would say here is you also, uh, you cannot use a variable before they're declared as well. So if I take this echo hello world, for example, and then I try and run it above here, then you're gonna see I'm gonna get a bunch of errors. Um, and the reason I'm gonna get a bunch of errors there is I haven't declared my variables down here. So that sort of top-down declaration is required. I must declare my variables before I use them. It's not like something like JavaScript where my variable declarations would get hoisted to the top. It's, again, it's more similar to uh, languages like Rust, etc., where I need to do my declarations and then once I've declared them, I can I can work with it. As I said before though, um, I can reassign my variables. So if I wanna give world a different value such as fish, that is okay, that is gonna work, but they must remain the same type because this is a statically compiled language. So I can change world to fish, but what I can't do is set world equals to five because five is a different uh, type. It's expecting an integer in this case, 
but it gets a string. So I statically, so it's not a dynamic language like a Python or a JavaScript where I can change types whenever I feel like it. This is ultimately a language that gets statically compiled to an executable. So therefore I must maintain the same types that I originally declare from. So, so far we've been writing to the console, but we also want to be able to read from the console as well. So uh, if I want to, I can, uh, let's just get rid of this and I'm gonna set at name equals to string. So in this particular case, because I'm not gonna set this to an initial value and I'm gonna read name from the console, I don't know what type this is gonna be and I'm not gonna set an initial initialized version of that variable. So I need to provide this a type annotation. In this case, I'm saying I'm gonna read a string. So if I want to read from the console, I'm just gonna say, ask for your name. And then all you need to, and we'll just do an echo, what is your name? And then I'm gonna do that read from the console. So read name uh, from console. And to do that, I just need to use uh, the uh, read align uh, procedure. Now, if we look at that here for a second, you see accepts F uh, file. Remember, this is just working with uh, standard IO underneath the hood there. So it can work with files, it can work with, uh, you know, it can work with whatever. So any sort of uh, impact mechanism. So to read from the console, I just need to type in STD in, so standard in. And now all I need to do is echo out the value. So display uh, value and we'll just get rid of world because that no longer exists and we can just put name. And you see if I now run uh, nim c minus r hello dot nim, it's gonna say, what is your name? I'm gonna say uh, Chris. And then it says, hello, Chris. So again, very, very simple. You know, this read line here, very simple, very Pascal-esque, by the way. Uh, in Pascal, it's read -lin, So read line is very, very close to that. Um, again, very JavaScript-esque as well. And JavaScript is console.readline. So I think this is sort of a nice sort of influence there. But again, and underneath the hood, it's taken away all of the complexity of standard IO that you would get from a language such as here, Rust or whatever. And it's a very, very kind of simple. And again, this, this language feels very simple, very Python-esque, very JavaScript-y, very scripty, but it's got all of the power of a compile systems language. And if you see there, uh, if I do an LS here, remember I've been doing a compile underneath the hood in my uh, directory, you see hello there, that's actually the compiled executable. So if I just do uh, dot forward slash hello, then it's gonna run my executable. We'll say Chris and it says hello Chris there. So I've got a compiled executable uh, under the hood there. And if I just do uh, an LS there for a second, you see there, this is a very tiny, what is 131K. So really tiny application compiled system app um, that, that I've built there. But again, I'm doing this within a very, very scripty based language, right? Very simple. So yeah, I think you can sort of see why this is super appealing to malware developers because they don't need to learn the complexities of Rust or Zig or whatever. They can just do super simple uh, scripting type uh, programming, but have all the power of an underlying uh, systems language. So we've seen variables so far, but of course Nim supports other types. So it supports uh, const, for example. So I can do const a equals 10 and Again, type inference is supported with const, so it's gonna automatically assume that this is an int in that sense. Again, if I wanna be more explicit, then I can use a type annotation and then mark that up as an int. And again, if we wanna output the result, we can do echo and we'll put a, and we're gonna concatenate the string. I'm gonna put a plus within here, and then I'm gonna put b, and then I'm gonna put an equal symbol, and then we're gonna put A plus B. Now if I run this, uh, let's just do my uh, compile and run, and you can see 10 plus 20 equals 30. Uh, so again, even though this is an integer, again, things like the ability to convert across types there, again, automatically supported within the language. So again, super simple. I've just went from an integer to a string. The echo has handled that nicely and beautifully. 
Of course, because it's a constant, if I wanted to change that value, if I decided I wanted to make b equal to a 30, you see I've got a red squiggly, 20 cannot be assigned to because it's a constant. Well, the other nice thing about nim is with constants, compile time evaluations are also supported. So if I wanted to, I could do this calculation here. So I could go a plus b, and then I could get rid of this a plus b here and do a c, and you can see that calculation has occurred. So even though it might look like a runtime calculation, because I'm dealing with A and B, which are both essentially set at compile time, then uh, the compiler is able to evaluate this. So, uh, so anything that can be evaluated at compile time, it will. So therefore I can do that calculation here. And again, that's gonna make it a bit faster. So again, if I come back into uh, my console, run that again, you see 10 plus 20 equals 30. So compile time evaluations supported with constants as well. So again, if I change this, so rather than making this b equals 20, if I change that to being a uh, var instead of a const, and then we make this uh, c a const as well, and then save that, you're gonna see cannot evaluate compile time b. So because b is a variable, it's mutable, then it can change, um, whereas for C, in order to do that compile time evaluation, it needs to know that it's a compile time value, so IE is gonna be a const. So therefore, it can't do that calculation. So, so in order to use that, you need to pick something that ha can be evaluable at compile time and cannot change at runtime whatsoever. And again, of course, if I get rid of that var, bring that back here, hit save, you can see I can do the A plus B one more time. And then of course the constant is a constant, so not only can it not be reassigned at compile time, it obviously cannot be reassigned at runtime either. So if I took the, uh, the what is your name example that we built earlier, let's make this into a const hello. We'll get rid of this name here. And then if I change this uh, read from const name to a uh, string, you're gonna see I'm getting an error, cannot evaluate at compile time. So the when I try and do that assignment of the cons, it's just like, nah, uh, read line here, you're pulling this from the runtime, I cannot evaluate that, so I cannot assign that to a constant. But of course, if I wanted to, I could do turn that into a var, and of course it's gonna work. There is one more type of uh, variable declaration that is supported within NIM, and this is this idea of a let. So to explain what a let is, it is it's kind of like a constant, but uh, it can be assigned at runtime. But once it's assigned, it cannot be reassigned. So if I come back to our example of reading the name from a console, if I did that, brought this back to a const there, you can see it got that error, if you remember, saying, hey, hang on, you cannot evaluate this at compile time. I could change this from a const to a let. Now, as I said before, a let allows you to be able to assign the value at runtime. How's that different from a var? Well, the big difference is a var, I can reassign the value when I want, but with a let, I can only do an assignment once. Once I've assigned it for the first time, I cannot reassign the variable name. So this would work. So if I uh, did my uh, uh, hello here and I typed in Chris, it's gonna come back with hello Chris and that is fine. But if I tried to reassign this, so if I said name equals world, I'm gonna get an error. You see, name name cannot be assigned to, and that's because it's let. But of course, if I turn that back to a var, then that's gonna work, and it's gonna say, no matter what I type in there, it's gonna say, hello world. So that is the sort of major difference here. You've got const, which is uh, you know a constant that it cannot be reassigned to at compile time. You've got a let, which can be assigned at runtime, but cannot be reassigned again. And then a var, which is fully mutable, and you can assign whenever you want. So that's the sort of major uh, variable declaration techniques that you can use in NIM.